of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia to our winter speaker series. This is our week where we're dealing, uh, looking at architecture and art. Um, and last night with Grace Ongyan and talking about branding and modernism and architecture. And tonight with our very own Lori Olin, who we love having as a shareholder, member, and friend at the Athenaeum. If you're new to the Athenaeum, I encourage you to find out more about us, to visit us, to sign up for more of our programs, to think about becoming a member so you can take advantage of our circulating library and all of our other perks of membership and become a part of this fabulous community. If you are trying to remember how to use Zoom on your computer or laptop, to get the best experience, if you go up to the upper right, you'll see speaker view or gallery view. Um, if you want speaker view, so you will just see the speaker, Lori, when he's talking and his slides. If you have a question that you want us, uh, me to moderate during the Q&A time, please type that into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you're wondering if anybody can see you or hear you, unfortunately, we do not get to see your beautiful faces or hear your voice. Um, that may be a good thing for you if you're sitting in your pajamas and um, eating your dinner. Nobody has to see you, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, but we look forward to seeing you again when we're able to restart our programs at the Athenaeum. I want to introduce, for those of you who do not know, our distinguished speaker tonight, Lori Olin, who is an Athenaeum shareholder and also a distinguished teacher, author, and one of the most renowned landscape architects practicing today. From vision to realization, Lori has guided many of Olin's signature projects, including the Washington Monument Grounds in Washington, DC, Bryant Park in New York City, and the Getty Center in Los Angeles. His recent projects include the award-winning Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Apple Park in Cupertino. And uh, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and recipient of the 2012 National Medal of Arts, the Vincent Scully Prize from the National Building Museum, and is Emeritus Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania and former chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Harvard University. And uh, one of the things he's doing these days is, is turning his many sketchbooks from his years of traveling and sketching landscapes in places like France. And he'll speak about some of the other ones tonight, I think that he's working on and, and getting them published. And so this is a beautiful book and invite everybody to buy a copy. And if you're interested in getting a signed copy to email Tess, after the program. And um, if you buy a copy, we'll figure out how to get it signed by Lori. But at this moment, I wanna invite Lori to uh, take us on a tour. We're looking forward to the adventure and everybody join me in welcoming Lori Olin. Thanks, Beth. Um, am I on live? Can you hear me? Okay, hi. Good evening, everybody. This is gonna be a talk about this recent book that I've done. And it wasn't really intended to be a travel book. But with the pandemic, oddly enough, and most of us all tied down in place, it seems to have become a virtual travel book. Um, it's really a book about drawing and it's about seeing and it's about places and paying attention. It doesn't have a plot. There's no arching over bearing narrative. It is, however, an explanation, I think, in a way of how a designer looks at things and presents a concern for observation for the immediacy of the world. So, you know, common stuff that we quite often don't pay much attention to or pass over. Um, things seem quickly and taken for granted. Now, as Beth said, there are, <laughs> I have a lot of sketchbooks. They, they, there are quite a few of them. Um, mostly, I've been doing it since I was a junior in high school. Um, and so there's a lot of them. And many of them just have quick notes, careful studies, some of them detailed records. They include measurements of things and places. And, you know, there are more careful composed studies, as you'll see. Some are records and portraits of people and things. Now, for instance, these two drawings are made decades apart in Paris. And the one on the left is the first drawing I ever made in Europe. And it's appropriately enough of a woman arranging flowers in the Cafe Voltaire in Paris for putting out on a table. I didn't realize that this was a very special cafe when I blundered into it at the time. And I've gone back since, as you see in the drawing on the right. Now, I've used various media over the years 
different fountain pens, pencils, and here you see a watercolor of the Seine from the Ile de la Cité. It's on a nice gray day, and you can see four of the bridges from here. Um, with the one in the foreground is that most delicate, lovely metal Pont des Arts, which people like to, young people like to picnic on. And here's a pen and ink sketch huh, of Notre Dame de Paris before the disastrous fire of April 219, uh, 2019. Now, one of the few drawings in the book that I've actually bothered to make of a famous or popular monument or a tourist attraction. Even then, the drawing is from the back of the building because this is where you can really see the structure and the hair raising engineering of this high Gothic building with its flying buttresses and where the walls are reduced almost to sheets of stained glass. I, I made it while I was sitting in this park, actually. Um, it, this is a pre houseman era place behind Notre Dame on the island there. It was made in 1844. And I find this a delightful space. These empty benches on a chilly winter afternoon tell you about the crowds that appear there in the summer when it's a nice shady place on a very hot day. Um, now, if, if this is a book about seeing, it's also a book about drawing and thinking about what one sees. For in order to draw something, one has not merely to look at it, but really you have to see it carefully. I did, however, once draw the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> this is it. Not much of a drawing, you'd say, but it's, it's a magnificent thing, peculiar, but wonderful. But I only drew it because I discovered this strange view of it from the cafe of that rather peculiar and controversial Musée Branlay on, on the Cave Branlay. When I noticed a bottle of sparkling water on the table in front of me with this visual pun, or an appropriation might say, of a drawing of the tower they substituted for the letter A in Badois. <laughs> and I thought, ah, there it is, touche, you know. Well, I have to say that my earliest drawings in France are a little scritchy, the one on the left from 1967, I think. But one of the things is that I was very interested in the public realm and in streets. And I started looking at streets and you can see this building on the Boulevard uh, Saint-Germain over here on the right. And there's, there's, look way up at the top, there's a man up there at a balcony railing. And so, you know, the thing is sitting still, you, you actually begin to notice things that you wouldn't notice if you're just walking around or taking a photograph. Now, one of the things that's the most delightful about Paris is this continuous texture of small ground floor retail shops. Here you see them in the Rue de Bontemps near the Jardin de Plantes. It's a delightful street. It, this is the sort of thing, it's the envy of American urban planners, something that we've largely destroyed due to our corporate economics of the last part of the 20th century. But you, this wall-to-wall -wall retail is just incredible in these tiny, beautiful shops. I, I studied streets, but as I, I have to say, along the way, I blundered into this park on my first trip. This is a drawing actually from the second trip in 1970, and it's in the Tuileries. And as an architect, I was really impressed by the Tuileries on my very first encounter. I, I couldn't believe what I found, the simple thing, just all these trees and all this gravel. Well, I've gone back many, many times when I studied the Tuileries. And in this later version here, you see one of the LAs of Linden's that were originally planted by Andre Le Nôtre. And, and the pavilion at the end is a piece of the Louvre. That's the uh, Pavilion de Fleur. And it was done by, uh, in 1607 by Andre de Cerceau, remodeled in 1664. <laughs> and then it was used as the, for the Committee of Safety. This is where they sentenced people to the guillotine. It was in the office in that little pavilion right there. And, and, but now that was the first place I ever saw a Michelangelo sculpture of the slaves. They've moved them since and they've got some other stuff in there now. But the combination of things here is unbelievable. Um, this is a drawing I made in the Tuileries not too long ago, where they flooded a couple of the little, what used to be grass squares with basins and they put this neoclassical sculpture of Diana in it. And here you can see the people sitting in the shade across the way under the horse chestnut trees by a cafe. And, and I began to look at these parks very, very carefully as, a, as I became interested in moving from architecture to landscape architecture. This of course, is one of the great parks of the world. Maybe my favorite park. This is in the Luxembourg Garden, the Jardin de Luxembourg uh, on the left bank. And this is a nice sunny afternoon in the summer. 
people stretched out using the chairs. And one of the things about this drawing is the way you can look way off into the deep space as almost Descartian infinity uh, as it goes off this grid of spaces. This is a park originally planned in the 16th century, then redone in the 17th century. It's been replanted ever since. They're still keeping it up. It's a remarkable place. Another drawing in the Luxembourg, not far from that last one. The last one was just up there to the right under the shade of those trees. And here, this is a drawing that's partly about how the eye works, how you start it, start, it sees this thing in the foreground right next to you, this big box with this palm tree in it. And then the eye moves off a little further, it sees the next thing. Then it moves further, sees a man running away toward a building. Then it moves further, deeper into the space. And finally it sees the palace. And then way off in the distance is this little silhouetted stuff under the trees. So this is a drawing that's about drawing, but it's also about seeing and about being in a place with a particular character. This is back up on that terrace. This is up there in the far right in the shade. This is where you get. And you are in this privileged place overlooking the basin in front of the palace of the Luxembourg. It's really one of the great spaces in France. And, and uh, here you see the, I was interested in the furnishings and the, the railings, the urns, the flowers, the, the big wooden tub, the statues of the Queens of France and how people had moved the chairs around and, and how the space moves off into the deep space in the distance. Still in the Luxembourg, this is now, this is an afternoon and what you see here is that uh, it's, it's late in the afternoon, the sun is starting to set out toward the south, toward the, toward the observatory. The police are blowing their whistles and people are starting to get up and move toward the, toward the exits, et cetera. And so this is partly about light, it's partly about a place, and it's partly about behavior. And I was, so the drawings for me in, uh, are records of all sorts of things. Now, one of the, oops, did I skip? No, let's just move along, okay. So in addition to, uh, to, to the historic royal squares and, and parks that were once uh, um, belonged to the crown and that have become public parks, there's also a set of famous public spaces that are cemeteries that are built on in the edge of town after the plagues and they decided to stop burying people right in town. This is in Père Lachev and that, that happens to be Chopin's tomb where those flowers are. Every day someone, no one knows who, brings these flowers and sets flowers at Chopin's tomb. It's been going on for decades. We, apparently there must be a group that does it, but there they are. This was in a cold blustery spring day and they were served, there was some plastic, but you know, it's, these, these become fabulous places. This is a park that is very well known because some interesting personalities, Baron Hausman is buried here. So is Oscar Wilde, so is Jim Morrison. Different pilgrims for different things show up in these, these uh, places. Um, along with the, those open spaces, the other open spaces that intrigue me the most about Paris and I spent the most time studying are the innumerable squares. They're big and they're small. They're distributed throughout the city. And this happens to be the Place Saint Catherine in the Marais. It's a very elegant little space surrounded by six story buildings. It has eight mulberry trees. It has six benches, three street lamps, eight cafes, believe it or not, around it. You know, all of quite differing ambitions, everything from high-end food to pizza, but something for everyone. It's a fabulous little space just off of a main tra heavily trafficked street. This is the Place Furstenberg in Saint-Germain. This happens to be one of my favorite urban spaces in the entire world. It's elegant in its proportions, the detail and its furnishings. It's very simple and yet it's very rich. Um, it's a perfect square. It's a cube of space. It has four polonia trees, the same trees that we have here around Logan Circle. And, and uh, it has one handsome lamp fixture, that's it. And it's an ideal space with beautiful light. And one of the things I've noticed by keeping track of it over the years is 
by now three of the tree, the four trees I originally knew have all been replanted. They keep, the people take care of this space. They love it. Just like people take care of their fancy clothes and their nice cars. This is a space to be taken care of. Now, part of the genius of that space is that little urban ensemble. You can see the plan on the lower right, uh, it's lower left there, that left-hand drawing. That's a, there's the square, but what part of it is so special about it is that these houses all, they have doors on the street, but then they all radiate back and have gardens and have other uh, terraces and stuff behind them. And one of them happens to be that building you see there, which was Delacroix's studio in his last days. Um, quite, it's now open to the public as a little museum and has a garden. But I'm, as a designer, a landscape designer, I'm often curious about the dimensions and proportions of things. And so quite often in my sketchbooks, there'll be measurements like this happens to be the street, a piece of the street that leads from the Place de la Concorde toward the Champs Elysees. And I thought, I wonder how, what, actually what dimension this thing is. So I just measured it, you know, a simple solution. You know, now another design that has intrigued me from time to time was a strange portion of a street that leads downhill from the Luxembourg Garden to saint sulpice And it's a very busy square down, down below, but this is a quiet kind of interesting place. It's a funny wedge-shaped pedestrian way that's raised above the cartway, the vehicular street. It's got several rows of trees on terraces, a step down, there's a pergola. And then there's this interesting fountain that was moved here from when Hausmann and Alphonse blasted the street right through this neighborhood. And they evened out the hillside grade and they moved the fountain up here. But the other thing to notice about this drawing, which if I didn't tell you, you probably wouldn't figure out, is that it's actually in a format developed at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, not far from here, which was called an esquisse, in which when I was a student, we had to know how to do. And that was, you always had a plan, and then you had an elevation or section, and then you had a perspective view. And you had to be able to put the whole idea down just like that, only we weren't allowed to write on it. <laughs> we, it had to tell it only through the drawings. But, but it's, a, it's a traditional way for architects to express and explain the complex set of things. This is almost an esquisse. This happens to be another delightful square. This is the little Place Igor Stravinsky right off the end of the, the Beauburg, the, the Pompidou Center. And um, it's, it's a place that is quite nutty and that has a, a couple of nice cafes, but it has this fountain by uh, Jean Tingley and Nicky saint Fal, where all these goofy little things spin around and spit water at each other. And it's really quite delightful. And then there, lo and behold, is a Gothic church. It's, I mean, this is a real mix master special that only Paris can produce this kind of stuff. Um, there are a lot of drawings in my sketchbooks from cafes and brasseries. They're an important aspect of the social life and of community in France. And they, they have to do with the daily life of everybody. This happens to be one of the most famous with expatriates and with American tourists back in the 60s and 70s. This is the Dumago. It's now been sort of recaptured by mostly the French and has fewer tourists. A block away was the Cafe Floor, which is where the real existentialists you know, hung out, Camus and Sartre and all those people. But, but the drawing on the left is on a Sunday morning in the winter. This woman, the family is there. He's reading the Sunday paper. She's feeding the baby. And they've got this goofy you know, uh, pram with, uh, with all these knobs and high-tech stuff the French are so fond of. But so the cafes are important. And, and they, they come in all sizes and shapes. This one uh, happens to be uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the long stem rose on the right is growing in a, is on a tabletop at the cafe up in the rather glossy cafe up on top of the, the Pompidou. But the one on the right is a fairly common scene that you might see at a lot of sidewalk cafes. It happens to be at a favorite watering hole of mine called La Palette, which is near the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Saint-Germain, a place where a lot of people meet in the afternoon and spend time, fairly common. This, here's a couple more that you'll see. Um, on the left is a table, a more up-to-date table and chairs in, uh, in the Tuileries. Those are by Deco, uh, current manufacturer. On the right, you can see back in the Tuileries and here, I mean, in the Luxembourg, and you can see these nice 19th century chairs 
that are, are so common there. They're heavy and really well done. These are the sort that you used to have to rent for a few sun teams from these fierce looking women who'd come around and rent them to you. They're now all free, which is part of the improvement, I'd say. Um, now, there are almost no drawings in, re in real proper restaurants in any of the sketchbooks, and there's a reason for this. And that is that um, it has to do with the amount of stuff that's on the table and what they're for. And when you go into a restaurant, there's, there's linen and there's flowers and there's cutlery and there's service and there's people and you're meant to pay attention to your, your, your companions. But when you're in a cafe, well, you just have a cup of coffee and spend an hour or two. You, know, you can draw, you can have a book, you can do things. So the difference between it's very hard to draw in a restaurant. So, but this is an odd, unusual one where my wife and son and I were, it was a New Year's Eve brunch that we'd gone off to the 11th arrondissement to this rather famous cafe that was stranded in the middle of a urban renewal project. And you can see they're advertising mussels and oysters there as the special for New Year's on that blackboard. It's a quite wonderful um, Belle Epoque, uh, fin de siècle kind of restaurant. It, it, what charming place. Anyway, it was a nice afternoon. Nobody was there. The thing about a lot of French architecture is how graphic it is. Uh, in fact, the whole city is. This, this sense of black and white. Um, this is inside of a, a flat uh, apartment in the Marais. And you can still see the medieval half timber on the inside, on the outside is clad with limestone. But this sense of black and white of objects silhouetted is something that's very common in a lot of French architecture and French buildings. Um, now, some places, of course, some apartments more up to date are more generous and they're more spacious, higher ceilings. And they have these, uh, interestingly enough, that they have these floor to ceiling glass doors that we call French doors. And when they open them, they, you know, it seems like, gee, the building across the street, your room goes all the way to the building across the street, which is not so far. This is on the Ile Saint Louis in an apartment there. And, and the only problem sometimes is street noise, but that's not too bad. Um, but of course, because the things come to the floor, you have to keep children and tipsy adults and pets from tumbling out the window. So there's this, they quite often have these uh, wonderful gratings and grills across them across set in the jams or set outside just very tight to the building like a balcony rail but there's no real balcony there and it's interesting what happened when I was doing this drawing on the left I was drawing the curly cues of the metalwork and then I saw right through it all the way across the street and there was a man sitting in front of the tobacco so I thought look at that there's a guy down there so so doing the drawings you discover things but the drawing on the right shows you the height of these gracious buildings built during the Haussmann era is uh, along the boulevards with these tall proportions. And this is a back courtyard, of course. And the French, you know, they are, they are uh, rightly thought of as being uh, people who, uh, their decor is famous. And, and one of the things is that in this particular case, we're staying in a hotel near the Luxembourg. And uh, I came back from a exhibition of Vuillard paintings at the Grand Palais and where all these people are meshed in the wallpaper panels and everything in those paintings. And, and I was just blown away by the curtains in the room. I thought, oh, I've got to do something about that. So I did this watercolor. Now, here's an unfinished drawing of the Place de Vosges on the left. And it's unfinished because of one of those frequent showers that comes through Paris happened and I had to stop. But um, we'll come back to that in a minute. But on the right, I want you to see that little doodle down at the bottom. This is what I was talking about, the graphic qualities of Paris. The, the white buildings with the black openings, the windows, the doors, the, the black people and cars streaming past. And then the bright color of the new spring leaves coming out against the plaster. You know, there, there's this absolute stunning uh, quality of visual quality you cannot miss when you're in Paris. Here's, here is the Place de Vosges, of course, this great real estate project of Henri Cart. Uh, on, the, on the left where a lot of famous people have lived. And here's one of those fountains from 1840s uh, at full work, you know, operating again. It's clearly summer, the leaves are on the trees. It's different from the last one. Now, the Place de Vaux, a lot of interesting people from Richelieu on through, uh, you know, Andre Malraux and all sorts of people have lived here. Uh, and there's a nice couple of restaurants and a nice uh, tea shop, coffee shop in it. But this is one of my favorites. This is the Cafe Bourgogne. And uh, it's in the corner um, of it and diagonally opposite the corner where Victor Hugo lived. And it's very hearty country food. 
Um, and I noticed while I was doing just as I was finishing this drawing, that Jacques Lang, the Minister of Culture, was sitting at the next table. And, so, and then there are usually a couple of people with one or two dogs there. So now, as a designer, I'm always interested in what's going on and what's being built. And the French are always radically trying to do some the next. The, for the most conservative people in the world, they also are fascinated by the avant-garde and radicalism. So it's a very interesting combination as a, as a national personality, if one could say that. So I w went over to the Gare Montparnasse to look at the new Jardin Atlantique when it was finished. And so here's a plan. And then I was noticing their new outdoor bus station. And, and so, you know, I'm always going around trying to figure out what's going on. And on the right is the, is the reconstruction of the Champs-Élysées by Bernard Huet, which is, I'd met him here at Penn. He came to give a lecture. And so I went to see what he was doing because he was rebuilding the Champs-Élysées. And that's about to go through another renovation, apparently this next summer. But so I was looking at the details of it. This is interesting. But Paris is a fabulous people watching place. That's one of the great pleasures of it, as we all know. And this is sitting at a very nice old hearty brasserie at the end of the Ile Saint Louis, looking across at a famous ice cream store uh, shop. And here on this bustling crowds go back and forth to and from Notre Dame. You're looking across the river, of course, uh, but, but people going back and forth to the Cité pass and it's a great place to watch people and see what's happening and who's wearing what and that sort of thing. This is another event, is a pleasant evening. People are gathering here for the Midsummer concert. Midsummer's Eve, June 21st, all over Paris and all over France now, they tend to have music all night. And so these are people arriving at the end of the work day for the concerts that are gonna take place. Uh, so that we left sometime around 1 a.m. and they were still playing and things going on all over town. Now, another one of the pleasures, of course, is art. And in my sketchbooks, and I only, I'm not gonna show much, but you know, there, there are a lot of doodles about me looking at art in Paris. And of course, it's become difficult to look at it in some of the places because of the hordes of people. But if you pay attention to what the times and how to do it and what's open late and where, you know, and there's a lot of things off, off exhibit. The drawing on the left, of course, is one of Delacroix's most magical paintings, the Demoiselle uh, d'Alger. And uh, the drawing on the right is just me doing an homage to Matisse and to Ellsworth Kelly after coming back from an exhibition at the Beauburg. I thought, oh, those guys, they're so good. And so I did that as just a kind of thank you to them. Um, a place that's usually never crowded, uh, kind of like here, is the Rodin Museum. And um, in the garden, there are some really wonderful pieces, uh, nicely cited. This creature I walked around and drew several times, but she's clearly inspired by his looking at Michelangelo's slaves, uh, which as I said, there was a copy or two of Ed Louvre, and, and he was puzzling about that, but he obviously transformed it into one of the women he was so fond of. Now, there is another great place that also is never crowded and is worth Take checking out, and that is Brancusi's studio, which has been recreated in the corner of the plaza in front of the Beauburg. Um, it, it has all the things that were in his studio when he died, pretty much as he left them. And it's been put there by Renzo Piano. And I just find it one of the most astonishing places. It's like this, these, these, all this modern stuff, the first abstract sculpture in history. And here it is, this, this, this potpourri of forms that he poured out there in that studio. Now, as it turns out, there is, if you're interested in the trajectory of architecture, Paris is a very good place to look at architecture from you know, the Roman era to the present. And it's especially rich in terms of early 20th century modernism, uh, which Le Corbusier, among others, uh, was one of the great uh, uh, authors of. And so if you go out to the University de Cité um, in the south of the city near the Périphérique, You'll find the, the Swiss pavilion and the, and the Brazilian pavilion, which he did with Lucio Costa. They're, they're absolutely spectacular buildings and they're beautiful. They're, they're real works of art. They happen to be better than all the work they inspired by everybody else all over the world, unfortunately. They're, they, they're really pretty good. The picture on the right is of uh, the studio he did not, it's a few blocks away from the uh, university. Uh, housing in that place. It, it's a studio he did for Ozenfant, a painter that he collaborated with. And it, it, was a, it was a lovely, simple, little, modest, and attractive building with obviously a great studio to work in. I envy it, frankly. Um, one of the things that happens is 
I'm always looking, as I said, at what's going on. And so this was dashing out to see the new Parc Andre Citroën uh, out in the uh, 15th arrondissement to the west. And, um, but in the course of doing it, I did notice something and that was that nature is a little casual in the program for making horse chestnut leaves. And that I'd always thought they were all the same, but lo and behold, it makes mistakes. They turn out all different ways. And so you learn things by looking at them. You know, otherwise, how would you know? Now, Paris, of course, isn't all of France any more than New York or Los Angeles are all of the US. And I would say that, you know, you got to get out of town. It's one of those sort of things. And the French love to get out of town. So one of the, this is if you drive south from France, from Paris, you want to get off the big motorways and take the smaller roads. And then you begin to find places like this. This is a town I never heard of called Isidun. It's um, it's not far from, uh, it's near Bourges, uh, which I've been to also, and has a fabulous cathedral. But here you can see the Tour Blanche, which was uh, a crusader castle built by Richard the Lionheart. Um, and you know, there's the town gate and a few pieces left from the castle that he built. But on the right is this behemoth of a, of a neoclassical Marie uh, city hall <laughs> built in the uh, early 19th century. But this was an interesting little town I blundered into. And of course, while we were there trying to get out of town, we had to evade the market, which was being set up in this parking lot with the usual war memorial with some dying male figure. And there were these old crones walking around with their shopping carts and their baskets and stuff. And it was very, I, I, there's the du chevaux you see in the distance, the old, the old the Citroens. The, a friend of mine drove one of those into a gas station in Oregon one day and the, the attendant didn't know what to do with it and said, did you make it yourself? <laughs> it's just like the Americans couldn't believe these cars actually. Um, further south, uh, if you go up over the, you have to go over the Massif Central to get to the south of France, because you know there's a continental divide between the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, and there I discovered this other extraordinary place called the the Le Puy. Le Puy. Um, it has a longer full name in French, Le Puy and Valais, I think it's called. But there are these volcanic plugs with these great statues, kind of like Rio or this the, the Saint Michael's Mount is a Saint Michael of the Eagles you know, up on, uh, on top of these pinnacles. And I, I was very taken by the, the town square. And once again, I went out and noticed who was doing what, where, how it was organized, that sort of thing. But then finally I did on my first trip, I went to Arles. I thought, here it is my first trip to Europe. I've only got three weeks. <sighs> I'm not gonna spend all the time running around everywhere, seeing everything and not seeing anything. But I, the idea that I only spend one your, your first trip to Europe ever in your life, you're age 29, you're a really excited young architect. And just to spend it only in one city, that didn't seem adequate. So I thought I've got to do something else. So I decided to go to Arles for a week. So I did two weeks in Paris and one week in Arles. I went down there. And so, you know, I got off and sure enough, there I was uh, and in the middle. And I walked from the train station and here was this square, the Place Lamartine. And there was the Termine, you know, bar Termine, and there was the, you know, <laughs> hotel Van Gogh or something. And there was the yellow house that Van Gogh and Gauguin actually spent the summer in in 1888. Uh, it was still there and you could see it and you could tell it was what it was. Um, walking into town, I was so excited. I thought, oh my God, look at this. This, I, going through the Porte de Cavalier with its 13th century towers, you know, trundling along with my suitcase or like looking around saying, good God, look at this, it's still here. These, these things and, you know, we were going to find a, a pension, which we did right away. There's nobody there in September of 1967, I promise you. It was a nice quiet little town, beautiful. And for whatever reason, you know, um, I, I've never done a drawing of, uh, of, of uh, saint in Arles, which is one of the most famous cloisters in the world. Um, and I, I didn't do a drawing of the Colosseum there, the, the amphitheater, which is the largest Roman piece of Roman architecture in all of Provence. But, but I did find that I was intrigued by sitting in a place like the Roman theater where there's Roman architecture. And then there was 
Romanesque architecture, and then there was Gothic architecture, and then there was this other stuff. You could see it all, and it was all right in one view. I, I was, I managed to get locked in here over lunchtime one day, not realizing that they were going to do that. <laughs> so I had to wait three hours to get out and have my lunch. But that's the way it is, you know. You learn by doing, right? That's how things go. And in the course of it, um, you know, I, I also uh, found that I discovered soup de poisson, which is my probably one of the best things to eat in the world. This is really quite wonderful that they make in Provence. But but so it, it, Provence. It sort of changed my life going there. I, I learned so much. And I spent time in this little square in the center of town, um, which is uh, Place Voltaire. And there's a hotel that still has some Roman columns in the facade. And this was the actual forum of the Roman uh, colony when Arles was part of Gaul. Um, not far up the river, just a few miles up the river, of course, is a complete Roman town just lying out there in the sun called Glanum. It's been excavated largely and outside of it, right, it's right on the edge of San Rime where the hospital was that Van Gogh was in. And, and one of the things, there's this triumphal arch uh, built during the reign of Augustus and a cenotaph to a couple of his nephews, two of his nephews. Um, Caesar Augustus, uh, Octavian, uh, the first uh, Roman emperor, was very fond of Provence. Uh, it was the favorite province. It's where he gave land to his veterans from his legions, hence the name Provence. It's the province, you know, the, the special one. Anyway, um, Provence is so wonderful. I've spent a lot of time coming and going through it and a few times staying in it. It's hard to pass through it without passing through Exxon Provence and this incredible roundabout at the bottom of the uh, Cours Mirabeau. Um, it's this great swirling, you know, as I wrote in my uh, notebook here, I said, into the maelstrom of the Mediterranean cities. You know, it really was, it was I couldn't believe that this fountain had the three graces on top of it. Then it had sea serpents, dragons, it had Roman emperors, it had lions, it had just damn near everything in this one fountain. And, and it was all going on all at once with this gendarmes trying to straighten things out. Well, I have to say that on different times, we've stayed in various places in Provence and explored around locally. And, and that this is one of the most beautiful, one of the most rewarding places we've spent was staying in an old mill, not far from Avignon on the west side of the Rhone River, that was, it has buildings that are derived and are, you know, go back to the papal uh, holdings when this was part of the papal properties. And um, uh, it, 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 one of the points of the book is that you can you want to go back and see something again and again and drawing something more than once you learn more things so this is the same as that last scene see this place you know look at that barn falling apart in the same gate and then here it is again i went back sat in the same grape field you know vineyard and drew it again and i saw things i didn't see the first time and i saw it differently and, and i presented it differently and here it is again, um, from inside the court, looking out toward the, the vineyards in the distance uh, there. And one of the things is, this is the Moulin de Rabat, uh, the former chateau. It had fallen into ruins, but, you know, as I sat there and drew it, you know, the sun beat down, the cicadas droned away, nay, 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 you know, and the, the irrigation is going on out in the fields. And, and there's this drowse over the whole thing. It was really quite remarkable just to be able to sit there. Well, places like this uh, seem to me, you can learn a lot about construction. You can learn a lot about form. You can learn a lot about materials and composition and the long-term adaptability and sustainability. And there's that chair again that I was obsessed by. <laughs> and then, but part of the attraction of drawing also is the sheer fun of making drawings, of, of discovering how to compose and present information each time. As in this very close study of a grapevine against a wall, and then there's this latch on the French door on the right that was like right next to my head. And it was like, ooh, look at that. Well, I love to walk. and I love to wander around. I've been doing it since I was a child. And in doing so, I, I came to the conclusion that Van Gogh was absolutely correct about the color and light of the region. He may have had emotional problems, but he didn't have any visual problems. He really could see better than anybody else. It, it, it's really true. This is the color. This happens to be in the, 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 the fields of the Cote de Rhone, um, the, the great 
vineyards there. And beyond those hills you see in the distance with that little crusader or castle above the village of Victor, uh, San Victor La Coste, beyond that and through that notch, that's where the Rhone River is coming down from the Alps. Now, the first step of all research really is, whether it's scientific or in the humanities or in art, is description. I mean, a very careful description about something is kind of hard to do without introducing some point of view or preconception. But the best we can do, therefore, is to attempt to just look at something really carefully and as uninflected as possible. I think this approach is what Keats was talking about when he was talking about truth. It, you To absolutely try to see absolutely the pure thing. Now, while wandering around in the expensive vineyards near San Victor La Casa, I came upon this last lingering fragment of a long vanished Romanesque priory. The, the rest of it had all been carted away for building material. And there was just this one piece of an, a little exedra standing. And that was all that was left in the middle of the vines. And, but also located not far from that was this tiny little unassuming village of Pascal de Font. And I, I drew it here quite economically and with very minimum elements of and the drawing and of the thing itself. The, the drawing is like the place. There's only four plain trees. There's a bar, the source, by the way, of delicious pan au chocolat in the morning. And then there's these two strings of bare bulbs for dining and socializing for the villagers at night. You know, uh, when it cools off and it's a nice place for them, you can see they all sit around. It's like the outdoor living room for the, for the little village. Now here's yet another study of that mill complex with a few of its handsome and well-placed elements. And I think both the place and the drawing are studies in richness of a few elements, how to achieve a lot with just very few means, you know. That, that's part of what I'm learning by looking at these things. On numerous occasions, as I said, I walked across that valley and went up through the vineyards to San Victor La Coste. And it's a very sleepy town. Um, it's largely owned by expats, I think, from the north. And it's seen here all buttoned up in the afternoon sun. And there's this chapel terrace, very quiet. And, but here's a different version of the same place just down the hill, another terrace. And this happens to be a very different kind of drawing. It's, I presented it in a different way because of the quality of the light, the dapple light and everything. And, and, and uh, it, it, it is, a, I have to say, possibly the nicest car park ever <laughs> with these ancient plane trees. Um, there's a bar at one end and a cafe at the other. It's a very convivial place. You can see a couple of teenagers, if you look real carefully, sitting on the well in the middle there. And, but the drawing is a graphic experiment in saturation and then dappled texture and the response to the actual visual scene that I was finding. It's very different from the scene up above, which is much more spare, wasn't it? Here, I am I'm back in the kitchen uh, at the mill in this converted mill building. And I was interested in presenting a study of how the eye sees, at least how I think I see. And it begins with this close focus of the artichokes in the foreground. And then it moves off deeper to see the crockery and the flowers on a table beyond. And then next past them goes to the far stone wall and then to a window and then to a door. And then finally just kind of trails off and loses interest over the dishwasher with some things sitting on in the far left. Here's a similar drawing, does the same, moves the same way. Likewise starts seeing something and it spots a sequence of things It moves around. In this case, massive stone fireplace with the heavy timbers. And then that's contrasted with a very rickety metal bed frame. And then there's a solid, stolid wood cupboard, you know, this kind of closet standing there. Very exercise in dramatic differences Ah, here, oh, this is hard to look at, right? This dizzying light filled this bedroom uh, with this chinoise fabric screen and the stone walls and this sort of odd bamboo furniture. And, and, but there was this visual release of the open window. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? You, you even kind of almost felt, feel the fresh air from that window in this very over, over textured uh, room. Again, I guess, uh, I use sketchbooks to make careful studies and rec records of things. Like these two remarkable chairs that are the most comfortable things I ever sat in. They're quite different from each other. They're equally comfortable, but the linen covering on them was interesting because they was similar, but different. They, they reversed the field and the figure in the two uh, different uh, chairs. And I thought that's interesting. Who would have thought of that? 
Now, drawings, it's a, it's a common place to say that drawings have a life of their own. It's true though. I started this one on the left, this drawing over on the left. I thought I'd make a sepia brush drawing of this vineyard with a, this poplar windbreak. And I actually hated it. So, uh, so I changed to, I thought, well, let's try it in color. And lo and behold, it actually worked pretty well in color. So I thought, okay, learn that. Don't do that one. <laughs> so, and another day, however, I went out and I thought, well, I'll try it again. And I looked straight on to the hedgerow and it was so boring, I hated it. And I thought, okay, well, you, I'm learning something, you know, don't, you just go out and do it and you always learn something. But while I was doing it, I realized that there was something much more interesting right next to me. <laughs> and that was, there was this, there was some uh, 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 acanthus. There was an acanthus in full bloom right there in the ditch right next to me. So I said, well, I should draw that. <laughs> so I did, and it's a better drawing, isn't it? Now, on another trip, uh, my family, we went to a different locale uh, on the east of Provence, beyond the Luberon, up the Durance Valley from X, to a remarkable hill town that you see here called Dauphin. Uh, in making this sketch, I realized Cezanne had really got it right. He really, he re I knew where he was coming from. He's, he, he, he absolutely had it down. Uh, I, I made a note to myself of this little map on the left of where I was, and you can see Dauphin's in the upper right up there. I say where it is, um, up near Fort above the Durance River, above the Luberon, at the very end of the Luberon Mountains. And on the right, you can see the amazing, amazing color that I found in that village. This was on the terrace of the place where we were staying, and it had been recently refreshed, of course. And these are the quintessential Provence all colors. And it was, we were there every evening and of course you're having dinner and as the sun went down and it was a great place to be, but look at the, the absolute visual saturation of that color. Um, this is it in black and white and it's much easier to, to look at uh, in a way. Um, that's the path up to our place and where we stayed. And there's this nice wall fountain at the bottom of the wall where we were. But again, this is one of those where the, the drawing is kind of a, a little too much, but on the other hand, it, it's the way you look. You look at one part and then the eye moves and then you focus on another part and then the eye moves and you focus on another part and then the eye moves down the street and then it goes around the corner. And, and so the, the eye moves around in this drawing the way it moves around in reality. That fountain had this incredible, <laughs> I love this spigot. Um, it, it's worthy of the Disney animators, but it happens to be a 19th century uh, dragon in, in bronze, it's fabulous. And people would come here and fill up their buckets and take them back to their house and wash their car, or do whatever they're gonna do. Kids played in it, pigeons watered themselves in two baths. It was quite a wonderful little wall fountain ran all 24 hours a day, one way. I was intrigued by the interiors of our place in Dauphin, in part because it consisted largely of simple flat plaster uh, over masonry walls. There were flat ceilings and tile floors. All of the trim, all of the ornament, everything about the place was actually painted on it. It was just paint. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was, that's it. it. Those moldings aren't really moldings, you know, it's just, and Here's how they do it. It's done with these bags of pigment that are from the local mountains, uh, not too far away. Mont Ventoux, of course, uh, being a famous mountain there uh, in Provence over near Avignon. But there in the house, one found, you know, the, the materials to keep it fresh. And, and, the, and again, the colors uh, couldn't be more regional than what you see here. We explored a bit. We like to poke around and, and see what else is going on. So east of Dauphin uh, and east of the Durance River are the foothills of the Alps. And there's a very high plateau known for growing lavender. And there's some wonderful, very solid Romanesque architecture there. And we explored it a bit and came upon this most amazing canyon, the, the Gorge de Verdun. And it was very dramatic, very deep, very narrow. Lots of tourists actually go there and, 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 and where it comes out anyway. The, the cliffs are covered with things like wild lilies, as you see. It was a, really a very interesting place. And so we rented a canoe <laughs> and went up the river <laughs> into this canyon. And, and we, this is in a shallow. I'm sitting in the back of the canoe drawing, of course. And my son is pulling us through the shallows. We were, we were, we were almost aground there. We went until we couldn't go any further. The water was too low because it was getting late. 
in the year and but you know the snow melt has pretty much over from the Alps. But the dramatic difference between this countryside and that around Avignon, of course, is can't be missed. And then I also did something else that I've been resisting for decades, and that was I finally broke down and made a pilgrimage to Cezanne's studio in X, outside of X. I hated myself, of course, doing it. And when I got there, and there was this horde of people standing around in the rain outside waiting to go in, I really hated myself. But when the minute I got to the top of the stairs and went into the room, I was so glad I had. It was this wonderful cube of space filled with light. And of course, this is the room where Cezanne painted that great painting of the bathers at the end of the hall at the PMA here in Philadelphia. And, you know, the, I mean, he took it out sideways through, a, you know, standing vertically through a, a slot next to the window that's at the far end there. I mean, it's just, there is all this familiar stuff, you know, there's the skull, there's the plaster cast, there's the, the pots and the paints, and there's the, you know, the shawls and the, and the tapestry and everything. It's all there. And it, it was, Absolutely a spiritual space. I, I felt I was glad I'd gone. Traveling in another direction on a different trip, of course, we, we found ourselves in uh, Aquitaine and Entre du Mer uh, out on the Atlantic coast. And this place, uh, Chateau Santou, is buried in the vineyards near Bordeaux. And as is my habit, I worked out the plan organization of the establishment. I decided I better figure it out how it works. And this is what it looks like. Um, and I was impressed as I was amused um, by I, I, this shows the, the traditional working buildings and the various towers, the turrets, the roofs uh, that were the height of fashion at different times in the past. And on the front terrace of it was this odd thing, which was quite wonderful. Um, it's a conceit. Uh, the terrace is only four meters wide. Uh, and it faces a public road. And there are these three linden trees that at the beginning of World War II had been both pollarded and pleached. And they form these kind of mop tops with these swags partially screening the road from the, 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 the rooms, the principal rooms of the house, which I thought was quite marvelous, really goofy and wonderful and, and effective. Now this is wine country. And like Napa Valley in our day, the region is chock-a-block. Uh, with trophy houses, albeit these are 19th century and older ones. Um, and there's this continuous carpet of vineyards, large and small. Um, Chateau saint is on the left and uh, La Cassade is on the right. This is really good wine country, um, as you would probably know. Um, but the best wine is in this region is across the river, across the Garonne and the, in the in the fl lower flatter area. That's where the Madoc and Omadoc and Santa Steph and things like that come from. But walking out into the vineyards, it was really interesting. It's been, a, I'd spent some more time in them here. This was a kind of messy, untidy one um, that needed weeding. Uh, but I, I thought it was fun to do this drawing just for sitting in the middle of the vines, listening and smelling and looking and, and poking at it. and as it is, you know, you're trying to puzzle out, how am I going to draw this? You know, what should I leave out? Um, it was fun to do. Um, this, you could say, is a traditional tabletop still life, a memento mori, uh, recording some of, with some amusement, the week's progress of our group through some of the more modest local varieties from the grocery store. But um, as the note for this drawing says, these vines were only a one field away from that previous drawing of the vines, but they were younger, they were on younger vines, they were more well, well tended, and they're trimmed very, to grow very close to the ground for the heat of the, during the cool nights when the maritime breezes come in and they wanna keep them warm to ripen them up in time. Again, it was kind of fun to compose the double page of the sketchbook rather like a sheet of music. Well, by contrast, turning the sketchbook vertically, you know, produces a completely different compositional problem. It's more akin to the Asian hanging scrolls or something. The content here as well also presents different issues of the interior and exterior situations. And one of them, the, the one on the left, the proportions of the tall 18th century room with this open balcony door and appropriately vertical uh, elliptical mirror uh, reflecting a naval figure of the period, that, that's one solution that seemed to work out pretty well. And then on the right, it was interesting. I stepped out on the terrace and you looked off to the neighboring chateau. And this drawing emphasizes this tall wall of the chateau right next to you. It's rather like a cliff that rises beside you on this very narrow balcony. 
So exploring this area, we came across this spectacular ruin, that of the Abbe Le Sauve Major, founded by Benedictine uh, monks in, from Cluny. And it had once been the center, an uh, intellectual center with agricultural holdings of vast estates, but it's completely gone and fallen into ruins now. And it had some of the most spectacular and deep and heavy Romanesque carving on the capitals I've ever seen anywhere. I, I was quite taken by it. I, I thought, holy smokes, these guys are really serious. But I think the other thing is that if I'd had a camera and run around and tried to take dozens of pictures, I wouldn't have learned anything like what I learned doing these few drawings because I really, really saw something and I really learned something and, and it was emotionally very good. So I'm gonna leave the sketchbook with this drawing uh, of something that we visited nearly a mile below the surface of the, of the earth uh, behind. And, and this is in a cave in the Dordogne uh, and uh, Ruffignac. And I, I, write about this at, I write about this at some length in uh, of my experience in the book. But for now, I just mentioned that this frieze of woolly mammoths was drawn 15,000 years ago. And it's done with such an economy that I think Matisse would envy. Or, but it was done by men who ran with these animals, who saw them, who knew them, and, and they put them down this aspect of their world. And in so doing, they're, they're sharing them with us today still. I, I've, I found this to be one of the most moving experiences of my life. So people often ask me, oh, do you use your sketchbooks for your work in your office? Um, do I copy things from my designs? And the answer is no, not really. Uh, but I am influenced by what I've seen and what I remember in large part because I took the time to look and to analyze something and enter it into my brain while in the act of drawing it. So here's an example of a fairly common Mediterranean park bench I first sketched in Arles in 1967. And then here's some studies that we did recently in our office for a, a contemporary bench and some full-size mock-ups we did to test the size and shape of it with modern people. Um, you know, just so... Yeah, it, it, it helps. Um, for instance, these are drawings I made at Giverny one year at Monet's uh, Lily Pond. And you know we all know his, his, his Lily Pond from the paintings, but I was interested in looking at the edge because I was in the process of trying to design a pond for a client uh, about 40 kilometers from there near Chantilly. And obviously I wasn't gonna make it like a copy of Monet's. But, but I really needed to figure out how to do the edge. And so it wants to be different. It doesn't want to be like the other, but it wants to work. And so, you know, you learn things by studying and drawing, I think, at least I do. And then finally, the, the last example I will give, and the most obvious one is that of the chairs. <laughs> I mean, students, uh, let's say that um, from all my sketching in France, and all my time in the Tuileries and the Luxembourg Garden studying behavior and the use of furniture, specifically seating, as I discussed in my last book, Be Seated, it was important to me when I did Bryant Park, what, 35 years ago now, that I said, gee, this park is really derived from the Luxembourg. Look at the parts in it. Look how it's worked. So I said, why not? Why not have loose furniture? Well, radical as it was in a public park in New York in the 1980s, today it seems absolutely normal in America. Nobody even bats an eye about it, but because it was such a clearly sensible thing to do. Um, so I learned a lot from Paris and from drawing in France. And I would say that students are always asking me well, about my materials and the equipment and what do I use to make my drawings? And they think there's something special. And I said, well, not really. And they're kind of I think it's surprised and reassured that that's it. There's a sketchbook, a bound sketchbook with decent paper and a fountain pen. You know, that's enough. You know, you can spit if you need a wash, right? Which is what I did for that drawing in, in an arrow. Sometimes I set out obviously with a little more and if I have pockets or a bag with me and I have a bottle of ink and a little uh, folding uh, watercolor box. Um, and that, you know, sometimes I'll add a pencil or a, or a better brush, but that's about it. That's all it takes. So that's it. Um, that's it for the, the most of what I have to say. And I will just say that um, it was fun doing this book. I did it with a man named Pablo Mondel from uh, Buenos Aires. And he and I are working on a new book. <laughs> going to start it, we hope, in May. And it, I've begun some of the work. It's going to be about Italy. It's called Italy Sketchbooks. So um, 
if these are all sold out, hope, wait for Italy. <laughs> anyway, that's it from now. Okay. So I can take a few questions. We're done. Thank you, Lori. This is just, uh, I, I expect all of us were just sitting here trying to, to get as close to the screen as possible to see these amazing images and um, memories of places that we may have been or places that we hope we can go. So thank you for sharing this. This is just, uh, it's been, um, it's been really beautiful thinking about your technique, your ways of seeing, as well as, well, vicariously getting to get out of our <laughs> get houses. out of town <laughs> and, and, and away it. from this impending snowstorm in some place that was sunny uh, and beautiful. Know. It's coming. It? <laughs> well, thank you very so, much for letting me sh show off here. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, so Monica from Manchester, UK is, is on and thank oh. you, Monica. I think we have a, a couple of folks joining us from London tonight and, and we're so glad you're here. It's really late for you. Um, she has a question about your watercolor technique and wondering if you start from one big wash and later focus on details or, or how you go about that. And also your favorite colors for using in daily sketches. Ah, uh, okay. Hi, Monica. Well, um, quite often, sometimes, it's different if you're working on a watercolor block versus in a sketchbook. In a sketchbook, you have the, the surface is not very rough. Uh, the ones I'm using is the paper's heavy enough to take a wash, but I will sometimes lay down a, a light yellow, very thin, thin, pale yellow wash if I want it to be really sunny, <laughs> if I want things to glow, but not in the sky, don't put it there. And sometimes, uh, I will do a big wash across the whole sky and then come back while it's fairly wet and add blue. The thing on the cover you can see actually where there's wet into wet there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, as usual, I, I, you know, you start somewhere, I quite often will start somewhere in the middle and, and usually do the lightest colors first if I can. Because once it's gone, it's gone in watercolors, as you know, you can only get darker, you can never get lighter. Um, and I don't believe in adding Chinese white, which even Homer used. I can't believe it. You know, some of those, he and mm. Sargent, they, they cheated. They did all kinds of stuff. They scraped and they did other stuff. Um, colors. Um, well, I like to have several blues, obviously. And uh, I find uh, the greens are the most difficult. And, and I've been chastised by several people, including my wife, are getting too acid with some of the greens. Sometimes the real, the real color of leaves is so unbelievable. When you put it on a piece of paper, it doesn't look right. So you have to mm -hmm. kind of gray it down or dull it down a bit. Uh, this is about as bright as you dare get it on the cover. It's a little sharp there. Um, uh, the blue got away from me by that roof. It's, it's a little too, too, too intense. It should be paler there. Oh, well, I hope that answers. Um, there's a curiosity about the brand of that that lovely red sketchbook uh, that keeps appearing. Uh, the, the lovely red sketchbook, that's by Senelier. They're made in Lyon, and you can get them at, uh, at Senelier. It's a bookstore in Paris. I've tried to order them from this. They used to sell them in America, um, and then they stopped, I think, because it just got too difficult for them. But um, So whenever I'm in France, I try to buy as many as I can in a shopping bag, but Senelier used to have more than one store. There's now just the one left down on the Quai Voltaire in Paris, but mm. it's a wonderful art store. They have great art supplies, as you can imagine. It's a block from the Ecole de Bazaar. Um, nice, they, they have books with different weights of pages, lighter and heavier, and they, some of them are landscape bound and some of them, you know, those, those horizontal ones you saw, which work real well. So that's where I get those. I, you will notice I had some other sketchbooks at different times, some of the black ones, the paper's too thin in those usually. Um, Moleskin now makes some that are very good and I've used them and they, they have one that takes watercolor very well. So there's a series of people who really, Rowney, I don't like their sketchbook, paper's no good, you know, <laughs> okay. Wonderful, and Sam is wondering, um, do, you do, the, do you do the watercolors back to back after they dry or do you skip a page I so skip. you can get another complete fold out. Okay. I skip, yeah. The back sides of the watercolor, I try not to write or draw on if I can help it. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's very hard. You never know what you're doing until you do it is the problem. 
But yes, I, I do tend to leave some out. And I tend to save the pages where the signature is sewn, where the, where the stitching is, for watercolors, because there the paper goes through and it won't run up and down the, the line and go into other pages and stuff if I can. OK. <laughs> um, and um, Peggy is wondering how you get the perspective so accurate, especially when you use pen and ink, so you can't erase and correct it. Oh, I've been just drawing too long. <laughs> so, um, well, pay attention. <laughs> what can I say? Um, I'm an architect. You know, I used to construct them mechanically, uh, but I also have drawn so long that you know it, it's not too hard anymore. That, that's not a good answer, but I don't know what else to say. How do you practice? You know, how do you breathe? <laughs> well, I, <don't> know. <laughs> I go in and then I go out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, it's it's a fair question it's just i don't know the answer it sounds like it's practice lots of practice yeah yeah, yeah. practice that's that old joke right about how do you get to right. carnegie hall <laughs> practice practice <laughs> practice <laughs> um bonzi says it's uh he finds it she finds it remarkable how you were able to capture the life of elements and textures and light and people that you know i think we all saw that that you're your sketches really, really jump to life. They're not flat at all. Thank you. Uh, and they have a question. Uh, if the existing architecture and ornamentation influenced the present architecture and architects uh, in, in how they, they build in, designs. In, in France is the question, do you think? What, what? I, I'm going to guess it's in France, yeah. yeah. Um, well, th there have been some architects who have been influenced by their traditional ornamentation and stuff, but not very many. Um, one of the ones that has uh, comes to mind, of course, is uh, what's his name? The, the guy who did the the Le Monde Arabe, uh, Jean Nouvel, um, uh, was very interested in it. And um, there's a couple of other architects there, but I, I don't, I think the most interesting thing about some of their 19th century uh, architects was that they came up with structures where the ornament was the actual structure. So like the Eiffel Tower, the ornament is the structure. The structure is its own decoration. And, and that was, I thought, quite wonderful. And I've thought about that a lot in some of the work I've done with pavement, that you know, pavement is a fabric and therefore the structure of it is its own ornament if you, if you want to go polychrome or whatever. But I haven't seen a lot of that in France. They're still quite beguiled by some of the... Uh, Mm, shall I say, uh, ideas of the Corbusier and postmodernism did them no favors at all. They, they built some of their worst buildings as, as we did and everybody else did, like, like the new opera house is just god awful, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> oh, and the new symphony by Novelle is terrible. You know, if you go to the, the Cité de Musique, and of course it became a huge set of lawsuits and everything, but but they have some other, in Ports and Park, there are some people who've done some pretty interesting stuff, I would say, you know, that I, I actually like. Not, so, uh, not really a good answer, it's just a, a, some statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carol says she's so glad to hear the chairs of the Luxembourg Gardens are now free. When she lived there in 63 and 64, the challenge she says, was to get up and move away just before the guardian came by for her money. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, you, you would like it now if you could go. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's, it's different. It really is. And there's plenty of them. There's always enough. To, you can find a place to sit. Um, and David Cornelius sends his greetings. He says, oh, you're hi. reminding me of how well you prepared me at Penn for Paris, which I love sharing with my wife. And he says, be well. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Um, Robert uh, has this question, or, or sorry, it's Mary Ellen has this question. Uh, if you ever wonder, wondered what happened to your sketches from your last exhibit at the Athenaeum, she says, I'm fortunate enough to take home, I, I'm fortunate enough to take home the reproduction of your Louvre painting, and it now hangs in my kitchen, and we're delighted to see it every day. Thank you, <laughs> from Mary Ellen Weber. <laughs> no, you know, um... Bruce uh, Lafferty took some stuff from my sketchbook and turned them into big posters and all kinds of stuff. And, and you had them around for a while. And I think they all just slightly, slowly wandered away. I don't know about them. Yeah. Tess and I will go on a... On a um, yeah, you, you may have a couple in a closet sorry. somewhere. Yeah. Eileen took some when she retired. So mm. 
They've been um, creating Eileen's office for years. <laughs> okay. So we may need to get a few more, Lori. Well, you can always, you know, uh, we can always make a few, you know, so anyway, that's okay. Um, and somewhere on the third floor. So, um, and uh, so Mary Ellen says there's still some on the third floor. So we will, oh, okay. we will go find okay. them. Jean uh, asked if you can give us a sense of time about how much time it takes to do an ink sketch and a watercolor in your sketchbook. Okay. Um, she says they create a wonderful collection. Well, let's put it this way that uh, I usually figure if I'm gonna sit down and do a drawing in pen, uh, it's gonna take about a half hour probably, but they can go, some of those more detailed ones go on to about an hour, but not longer. The watercolors almost inevitably take about an hour because you have to lay, you, you need time for certain parts to dry before you do the next piece or you're gonna mess it up. I mean, there's a couple of quick sketches you can do in 15 minutes, but the pen and ink drawings are never, you know, maybe if once in a while I'll get something in 15, 20 minutes, but usually it's between a half an hour and an hour. So you just, and so I'm sometimes not much fun to travel with because I sometimes just, don't keep going, you know, I stop. Uh, and sometimes I'll just spend a whole afternoon somewhere and only do one or two drawings and fill up the whole time with it. So mm. sitting still is something I'm good at, <laughs> walking and sitting still. <laughs> well, Kathleen uh, says, thanks, Lori. I love to see your watercolors and drawings and it is not cheating to use opaque white, she says. No, Turner I know. did as well as Homer and Sargent. You're yeah. doing it the hard way, but others do well with white. Um, <laughs> I, I know, I know that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you, you made a very controversial statement. Um, yeah. So one one last question, I think, is a nice nice okay. way to end. Um, does the the thing, the object, or the view that you see drive your style of sketching? Since there were so many sketches mm -hmm. styles yeah. evident in your book. I think so. Uh, well, sometimes I'll be in a mood that I want to do something, you know, and I, I want to go do this or that. But quite often, as I suggested at one point in the talk, um, the thing itself tells you, try this. And so like uh, that bedroom that was just like too, too busy and hard to look at told me, go for lots of texture, lots of small stuff. And, and But when I was in that little village in the middle of the vineyards, uh, it was so pear, spare and pure that I only did a few lines, you know. So the subject does help you, yeah. That's it. Well, thank you. And thank you. This is this has just been lovely. I hope everybody, Great. we have a copy at the Athenaeum Books uh, Library, but you can also buy a copy. Um, we have like, just went on the screen, our bookstore.org site on our website. You can uh, purchase a copy if enough people who I'm sorry, in London, we, we can't just hand deliver it to you, but if you, if you live close enough to the Athenaeum um, and you're interested in, in, in buying your copy and then bringing it by for us to get Lori to sign it, please uh, let Tess know. You'll just have to purchase a copy and we'll, we'll figure out a time and way to do that if you want a signed copy. Um, and invite you to join us for other upcoming programs. Next week, one of our, our Tuesday noon time is uh, uh, I'll swing around again, uh, a talk about the, the Lucan's clock uh, by Elizabeth oh. Fox. We have Malcolm Tur Turnbull, who is the former prime minister of Australia and an Athenaeum shareholder as well, speaking on February 23rd about his latest memoir. Um, should be a really fascinating conversation uh, moderated by uh, their ambassador in Washington, DC. And um, our, our library is open. If you wanna come and check out books, have a place to to study while you're safely masked up and social distancing or, or just to be in a place that's a little inspirational 